It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have no idea if any of you uh, have been using data simulation techniques, have heard about data simulation before, or if any of you has plans to using it in the in the future. So if you, if you have questions or uh, anything, you can feel free to interrupt me during the, the lecture. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, sinon quoi? <laughs> okay, just hold me not that button, so I'm now I really want to press that button just to know what's going to happen if I do. <laughs> okay, so first of all, okay, this lecture is uh, is entitled Data Simulation Training Course at SEMHAX. It's an introduction lecture, and I will focus on variational algorithms. And then my colleague Vivian Mallet from INRIA, who's sitting right here. Uh, we'll continue this afternoon with a focus on uh, filter algorithm and ensemble-based methods. First of all, I really want to acknowledge my colleagues at Surfax who also worked on the training course in data assimilation, not only for this session today at SEMHAX, but more generally speaking, uh, we have training sessions on data assimilation at Surfax. So I really want to thank Céline Guirol, Anthony Weaver, Olivier Tuel, and Mélanie Rochou, who is in the, he's in the room, uh, she's in the room right now. Um, just to, to, to give you a little bit more of an idea of what Cerfax is, so it's Cerf Cerfax, it's not Semrax, it's not the same. Uh, it's a research lab. We're in Toulouse on the Météo France campus, and Cerf uh, Cerfax is uh, co-founded by seven shareholders, that are EDF, Total, Onera, CNES, Safran, um, Meteo France, and of course I'm forgetting one of them, but never mind, there are seven of them. And all those big groups, either private or public group, kind of got together and put some fund in, in Safax to share some research uh, application and research field, especially on the uh, high performance computing, and we have at Surfax uh, <coughs> big computers that are within the top 100 uh, list of uh, computer resources. So um, I'll start my lecture with a couple of general ideas of what data assimilation is and what it has been used for so far, and I will try to introduce some, some idea of why it's useful, and then I will move on to some math and some uh, algorithm and methods. <coughs> so, okay, uh, we have five sections here. The general concept for data assimilation, I'll start with what data assimilation has been used for uh, over the um, maybe five, four, five last decades. Data assimilation is, has been used widely for numerical weather forecasting. So here you have a weather forecast map, and the idea is really to be able to forecast the, uh, 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 the weather at short to mid time, um, lead time. For that, we have models, and you see here a global grid um, model here uh, at uh, for 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 the atmosphere, and those models are constantly improving. Never mind, they're not perfect, and we're not, it's not reasonable to just rely on those models to provide, uh, to provide a forecast. So we use observations, and there are various types of observation for the atmosphere. They are available but they don't provide a neither complete nor perfect description of the atmospheric system. So the idea is really to combine this information, coming one, one coming from the model and the other coming from the observation, to actually provide a weather that is reliable. And we provide an analysis that is, okay, so that was here. 
uh, that is a better estimate of the state of the system. So let me just comment this graph here. So this is time, and this is some output variable. Here it's some weather variable. You can think of pressure or temperature or anything you want. Uh, and in French, it's temps in the, in the, for both, but it ha doesn't have the same meaning, of course. So, and the reality is the blue line here, and we would like to know it up to now, but also in the future. So if you think um, that the present is here, the reality has some past and it has some future tomorrow. And we have some observation, that's the blue star here, of what the weather is today. So this observation, if we go back to the previous slide, uh, it's, you have some remote sensing data. It's a really rich type of data. Um, and it will provide you with a global description of, what, of some weather variables. You also have a whole bunch of in-situ data. You have some radio sounds. You have in-situ um, pressure measurement, measurement, temperature measurement. You have some meteorological station that, that are on field. And these observations are represented with the blue star here. And if you run a model, you start the integration, let's say, yesterday from some initial condition, and you run your model up to today, you will probably notice that what the model tells you on your system kind of differs from the, reality, from the observation you have. And you don't really know if this difference comes from some model error or some observation error. But either way, you want to provide something more certain on your system, and that's the analysis. So in the following slide, I'll be using some vocabulary that I'll try to uh, explain. Uh, so I'll start here with the word analysis. I will also use the word background. So that would be the, the green dot here. The background is basically what the model tells you if you let him run uh, freely. And when you use data simulation algorithm, you basically combine the green dot with the blue star, taking into account the errors that are related to each um, uh, information here to provide an analysis. And you assume that this analysis is a better description of your system so that you can start from this analysis to run new model forward in time up to the next observation time and location. And with this, you're able to provide forecast in the future. So how does that work? Basically, you can think of it as a cost function. The, the variable, the, the, the control variable, it, it will be denoted by x in the following slide, but for now it's just uh, denoted as a red square here. So that's what I'm looking for. It's the state of my system. It's whatever I want to know on my system. And you basically write a cost function that computes, computes a distance between what we're looking for, x, and what the model says. You write that distance within a norm, and I'll talk about those, these norms and the, the matrices that we see here later on. And you have one part that, it, that relates to the difference between what we're looking for and the model, so that this distance, Euclidean distance. And then you have a second part uh, that describes the distance between the observation and what we're looking for. So you may notice that here I have some G operator here. And the question is, why do we need that? Do we always need that? And is it complex? And I will also ask, uh, I will also talk about those B matrices and whether they are complex or not. Just, just to give you a brief idea of what, what is in G, basically what you're looking for, what you're trying to improve on your model may not be in the same space um, as what you're observing. For instance, you may um, observe temperature everywhere in this room, uh, sorry, at one location in this room, and you may have a model that will simulate the temperature everywhere in this room. So in, in order to compare what you observe to what you model, 
uh, simulates, you have to select one location in this room where the, your thermometer is. And so this G operator would do that for you. So that's a simple example where whatever I'm simulating is really easily comparable to whatever I'm observing, but it can get even <laughs> trickier. For instance, in, meteorolo in meteorology, uh, we would observe radiances, and the model does not simulate radiances. It would simulate pressure, temperature, humidity, and all that stuff. And to go from the model variables to the radiances, you need some integral operator. And that would be embedded in the G operator here. So I will talk about that a lot more in the, in the, in the following. Um, those matrices I will also talk a lot about. Basically, they give you an idea of the errors, the uncertainty on whatever information you're going to use. So for the B matrix, it's the background error covariance matrix. I told you that the background is whatever the model says. And basically, B is giving you, is providing you uh, with a description of the statistics for the background errors. I will explain some more. And this is the equivalent, but for the observation. So I hope the, the, the idea between this graph is clear. If it's not, just let me know from now on so I can make it clearer. Otherwise, it's going to be tricky in the, in the following. So feel free to interrupt if you need. OK, some more vocabulary and oops. OK. So I'm still using my green dot here. That's the background. That's the analysis. And an, Im an important word for me is what is the control? Basically, what the control is is whatever I'm trying to improve on my system. I may not know what the output variable of my uh, system look like, and that, that's maybe what I want to improve. That's probably what I want to improve. But do I want to improve those outputs, or do I have another way to improve those outputs? I have to decide where, uh, which input is responsible for the errors on my output. Because basically, for my model, I have a whole bunch of uncertainty, and those uncertainty in my input are going to translate into uncertainty on my output. So if I have several uncertain inputs in my model, I have to decide which input is responsible for the errors on my output. It, has, it, has no, it makes no sense to correct, let's say, a model parameter or a model input that has no uh, impact on the output. It's not going to help me improve my output. So I really have to figure out what I want to correct on my system to improve it in the future. And this is my control. And then you have the observation operator, G, that I just talked about. And it will help you moving, moving from the control space to the observation space. So basically, now you have some observation-like uh, information that you can compare to the measurement, the actual observation that you have on your system. And now you're able to really write a cost function. I'm not using uh, stars or dots anymore. I'm using uh, vectors. So this is a cost function. It will just basically provide you with a scalar. X is a vector. Inside, you can have whatever you want, either a field or a set of parameter. And this is a matrix, and it's the background error covariance matrix. So basically, you compute some uh, X transpose matrix X computation. And this, of course, is a scalar. This also, on the other hand, is a scalar. So the cost function provides you with a scalar for each X. And you want to minimize that cost function. Um, so the important idea here is that the equivalent of the observation are extracted from the vector, the control vector, uh, through the observation operator G. And in the following slide, it will also be denoted by H. And somehow, pre preparing those slides, I just couldn't make I uh, couldn't make up my mind whether to use G or H, because if you look at the literature, it really depends on what's inside. So I will try to not to lose you with this notation. So it's either going to be G and H, but you'll see that 
uh, it has a meaning. The, it makes sense to call it H or G at some point. Um, well, and yes, the last sentence is the cost function associates a real number to any vector x in the control space. So whatever I want to correct, uh, given a background state here, and that's xb, that's my previous information on the system. It's also a vector. And a vector of observation uh, y o. OK, so this cost function is going to be written um, a little bit differently, whether you're trying to control your model state or some model parameter. So first, let me just make clear what I mean by model state. For me, my, my, the model state is basically the quantity of interest that you get from the model output. So if your model simulated the temperature in this room, my model state is the gridded temperature in this room. Your model is probably discretized over a grid, whether it's structured or unstructured. That's not really the point here. But that's the, that's the model state. That's what your model said. And, and if your model uh, has a dynamical evolution in time, your model state is also going to evolve in time. So if we decide to control the model state, the control is x, and it, it is going to be a field, basically. It could be a 1D field, a 2D field, a 3D field, depending on what your model simulates. And basically, you're going to write that into a vector. So if it's a 2D field, just um, enroll it in the, in the two dimension. But basically, x is the output variable for your model. And of course, if I go back to this uh, graph here, your model state at a given time, at, for instance, at the observation time, is also an initial condition for an integration further in time. So, um, if I want to correct my model state, here actually I'm correcting an initial condition for temporal evolution of my model. XB is the last forecast of the model. That was the green dot that I showed you a while ago. Then G, the observation operator, is the link between this initial condition here and the observation. And we can assume that this observation are um, spatially distributed differently than the model outputs from my model. So I have to deal with some spatial, for instance, interpolation or extraction in my observation operator here. Uh, y is the observation simulated by the model. So that's the output of the observation operator. So it's called observation, but it's kind of a, an equivalent observation. It, it doesn't come for a measurement. The measurement is the actual vector y o, and this can be compared with the model observation here. Now, if you assume that what you want to correct in your model is not the model state directly, we can assume that we want to correct some model parameters. Of course, when I write a model, I, have a, I'm, I make a whole bunch of assumptions and do some simplification. For instance, uh, on the physics of my, um, the dynamic of my model. So usually you have some empirical formula, you have some simplification in your physics, and you have a whole bunch of parameters. You don't really know what you put in that. And they're usually uh, sources of important uncertainties. And a way to correct the model output is to correct those model parameters. So if you want to correct the model output, you're going to correct the model parameters, and then you have to run your model again. So you start with a background value for this parameter. So now x is no longer uh, the model state, but it's a set of model parameters. It's a vector of model parameter for, for instance, lambda 1, lambda 2, blah, blah, blah. So it's still denoted by x. It's, a, it's the control vector, but it doesn't include the model state. It just includes the model parameters. So you have some initial value. You have an idea of, the, of these parameters, that what we call the background. And now you used to provide the equivalent of the observation. Um, for those parameters. So basically, if you think of uh, a diffusion equation, the model parameter you're trying to correct is the diffusion coefficient. 
And if you wanted to compare this diffusion coefficient with an observed temperature, you can't do it. You, you have to run your model using the, co the diffusion coefficient that will provide you with a temperature, a gridded temperature, that you can then compare to some measurement. So now, in your observation operator, you have to run your model. You have your forward model that is in included. And then it gets a little bit trickier. Wh whatever is in your observation operator is a bit more complex than what I was, than what I was describing further, um, before. Um, so that's a major difference in data simulation to really know what you're going to control and all those um, statistics that are here really relate to whatever you're controlling. So if you control your model state, you have to write the background error covariance matrix for the model state. If you're going to control some model parameter, it's the background error covariance matrix for the parameters. You have to describe some errors on your model parameters. OK. So yes. Just a little bit of history before we move on. So basically, we have two centuries of data assimilation um, before, before us. So at the end of the 18th century, uh, those, these methods, even though they were not really named data assimilation, were used for planet orbit, com orbit computation by GOES. And also, uh, the least square method was developed by Legend. And of course, those names we've heard a lot since then. Um, in the beginning of the 20th century, the concept of maximum likelihood was introduced by Fisher, and I will talk a bit more of maximum likelihood in the following. In the mid of the 20th century, the Kalman filter that Vivian will talk about this afternoon was introduced for the, the Apollo program, and we also started uh, mentioning objective analysis of meteorological fields. So this specific point here, Objective analysis for meteorological field is really the beginning of what we know today as variational data assimilation for numerical weather forecasting. And it was really formulated that way at the end of the 20th century with a 3D VAR data assimilation weather for weather forecast model. I will really explain what 3D VAR is, so don't worry at that point. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that moving on from 3D VAR to a more advanced method that is called 4D VAR, uh, provide a gain of 20% on the forecast quality, and this is what is being used uh, today to issue some uh, weather forecast. Okay, just uh, we'll show some uh, three examples of application, just so that you're aware of what is, where data simulation is used kind of daily. So the first example is meteorology. meteorology. So you see here, you have a picture of a discretized model for the atmosphere, and you have a um, satellite map of um, part of the Earth. You have a satellite here and a radio sun here. What we're trying to control, the control vector that I, that I was mentioning before, are, is basically 3D field. We're interested in temperature, pressure, humidity, and wind. And for winds, we have the amplitude, and we also have the wind direction. So that's several millions of grid points, because the, the, the atmospherical models are now really high resolution. So the, the, the models, uh, if you want to describe the model, you really have uh, the size of the control vector is really, really big. It's probably 10 to the power of 8 or 6. And what we have, as for the observation, it's really a whole bunch of various data, ranging from satellite data. You have surface temperature and winds. You have clouds. You also have chemical concentration. And chemical concentration, it, it will also um, enable us to relate the numerical, the meteorological dynamic questions to air quality question that are really getting important today. Uh, we also have some in-situ data of temperature, pressure, humidity, and winds. So in the end, you end up with a million of observation. So really, you have a huge system with a huge control vector and a huge uh, observation vector. 
and writing the cast function and even describing describing those these vectors, especially these matrices, is really complex because you don't really know what to put in that. But even if you knew what to put in that exactly, you end up re with really big matrices. And computing this color product is, is really tricky, and especially inverting those big matrices is, is really tricky. Um, so weather forecast is a significant example for data assimilation, and most of the time, the analysis is the initial condition of the met meteorological model. That means that what we control is really the model state, mostly. Um, I'm not really saying that we don't control model parameters, but mostly what is important is short-term short forecast. So if you have a proper or correct initial condition for your system, you're going to integrate it a little bit further in time, and you probably end up with a forecast that is reliable. And you don't have to correct your model parameter. It's not critical. It would probably become critical if you were trying to issue some longer uh, lead time forecast for meteor meteorology. A second application is in oceanography. So you have kind of similar models uh, to describe the uh, similar model to what you have in meteorology to describe the dynamic of your of the ocean. By dynamic of the ocean, I mean the currents, the temperature, and the salinity. Here um, you have. Sorry, I don't know if you can really see it, but you have outputs uh, in the vertical direction of the temp. What is it? Yeah, temperature uh, tr stratification uh, with a negative and a positive, a negative and a positive increment uh, with respect to the to the mean, and that's altimetry. So basically, that's what level. And you have also an observation of the the ocean fields, and these observations are either remote sensing data and in situ data. For instance, with the Tau. Um, buoy that are in the, in the Pacific Ocean. And what we want to control in ocean is 3D field, basically temperature, salinity, and currents. Once you know that, you're probably uh, able to properly describe the dynamics of your, of your ocean. You also want to describe the altimetry, so that's the water level elevation. You can think of it as uh, your, uh, your sheep uh, company, and you want to describe the routing for your sheep, and you really want to know what the currents are uh, and uh, the water level elevation, so you can optimize the, the, the route for your, for your ferries. Um, and another, another interest for ocean data assimilation is to give a proper description of ocean states so that you can run uh, atmospheric ocean coupled model because that's important if you want to issue some, for instance, um, mid-term forecast in, in atmosphere. So you end up with about one million grid points for the ocean model because the, the resolution is really high. So here again, it's a big system. And if you look at the observation, you really have a whole bunch of observation. You have sea surface temperature, for instance. You have altimetry, of course, that I forgot to write here. You also have some in-situ data. Well, those data are really sparse. The repartition of those uh, data is really not homogeneous. You can, you can really imagine that you have a whole bunch of data in some part of the, of the ocean, and some other part of the ocean are just barely observed. So it's really unequal. But still, you end up with several thousand of observations, especially thanks to satellite data. So it's kind of similar to meteorology. You really have big vectors for control vectors and for observation vector. And writing the cost function and the vectors and the matrices that I, I mentioned before is, is, a real, is really a key challenge here. Uh, out of today, operational oceanography is more recent than what we have for meteorology. Uh, but it really shares a lot of method, of method with meteorology because it's also large dimension questions. I'll move on to a smaller system, and I'll talk about hydrology. By hydrology, uh, you can think of hydrodynamics of a river. 
You can also think of global scale hydrology, but basically what you're trying to do is have a description of discharge for one river, for all the river around the world, for you can want just some discharge are at large exutory on rivers, or you can really look for discretized description of discharge. So you can think of hydrology as, as a, an application that has a whole different range of dimension, of spatial and temporal dimension. But in the end, what we're trying to describe is the discharge of a river and the temporality of those discharge. You want to know how much the discharge is going to be and when, uh, for instance, a flood peak is, gonna occur, is going to occur. So you're really interested in the dynamic of your, of your river. What we control here is either 1D or 2D fields. It depends if you're using a 1D or a 2D model. If you're looking at your, your, your river uh, along the flow, or if you're really looking at it in two dimensions, usually when you think of river, you don't, you're not really interested in what's going on in the vertical. I mean, usually, but it can also happen. Uh, so you have 1D, 2D fields, and those fields are water level, um, groundwater constant, soil humidity, velocity, and by velocity, this includes discharge. And here in hydrology, we usually have a whole bunch of parameters that are important and really uncertain. For instance, drag coefficient, hydraulic conductivity, and dra by drag coefficient, I mean friction coefficient. Um, I didn't mention the geometry of the, of the river, the riverbed and the floodplain, but you have really the description of the river that is important, and that's why in, in hydrology, uh, we control parameters as well as uh, model output. So the control vector here would be either the model state, as I explained before, but also the model parameters, at least in the application that we have uh, at Surfax. Uh, those models usually are smaller, a lot smaller than meteorological and ocean models because they are not global for most of them. And when they are global, the resolution is not as fine as small as what we have in ocean and in uh, meteorology. So we deal here with a thousand of grid points. So when you think of the X vector and the B matrices and so on, it, it, they really are smaller than what we have for meteorological and ocean. If you look at observation, observation vector, here again you have satellite data, data. basically you have groundwater content, you have altimetry, you know the water elevation from space. You also have a whole bunch of in-situ data, especially in Europe, you have some real, we have some really well-gauged rivers, <coughs> sorry, with a proper description of water level. We also have observation of precipitations with pluviometers, with radars also in the satellite data, and we end up with hundreds of observations. So you see that if you compare that ocean and meteorological, uh, questions, we have smaller dimension. Um, and data assimilation has been used um, in more recently in the field of hydrology than it was used before in, uh, in meteorological ocean. Uh, it is used to predict floods, and it really depends at what lead time you, you're interested in flood, and it, it's also used for water resource management a lot. Okay. So this was the general concept for data assimilation and the, the major field of application for data assimilation, uh, especially with a focus of, on what we do at Surfax, and I'm sure that Vivian will provide some complementary application uh, to, to what I've shown so far. So I will we'll move on to classical algorithm for data assimilation, if there is no question. Okay. Okay, so in three hours this morning, I'm not going to provide a full um, lecture on data assimilation for all algorithm and for all application. I will specially focus on variational algorithm, and this implies the minimization of a cost function that I've shown before. And the Kalman filter algorithm will be described this afternoon. They implied some linear algebra computation. The cost function is kind of uh, hiding 
you can think of it as the cost function is hiding in the Kalman filter, or the Kalman filter is hiding in the cost function. You can think of it either way. But in the end, if you make similar assumption for the variational and for the filtering algorithm, you really end up with the same solution, with the same, um, the same result, basically. So there, there is really two methods, two ways to implement data assimilation. And you're going to have to make assumptions on your system and on your operator. And assuming that you make the same assumption, you will end up with the same result. So there's no reason for opposing the variational and the filtering method. It's really complementary. Uh, in the following, we'll see that variational data assimilation methods lead to the minimization of a cost function. And to do so, we're going to write quadratic form based on both the background and observation covariance matrices that I've shown before. When the observation operator G, I've shown before also, is linear, this, this formulation of the cost function leads to the best linear and biased estimation. It's the blue equation that you may have heard of. And the analysis is basically the sum of the background plus a gain matrix, it's the Kalman filter gain matrix, multiplied by the innovation. And I will, uh, I will really define what innovation is, and I will also talk some more about the blue algorithm here. And this algebra can be used in the nonlinear case with an incremental approximation of the cost function. That's why I was mentioning some quadrating form of the cost function. Uh, we will end the, this lecture with the 4 var formulation. And this afternoon, you will hear about the Kalman filter methods. And basically, those methods um, enable us to take into account the time evolution of the model and the measurement spread on a time <laughs> interval. So basically, that's a short summary of what we'll talk about. So don't worry if, some, if there are still some mysterious words in, in there. I'll start with the minimum variance approach, variance approach, sorry, and we'll try to move from move on from a small, uh, simple explanation of what minimum variance approach is to the general data assimilation algorithm. So I hope you understood that we're looking for an analysis that it's denoted by X with a superscript superscript A for analysis. The background has a superscript B for background here. Um, here, X, A, X, B, and Y are vectors, and that's not going to change. We are looking for an analysis as a linear combination of what we know on our system, and what we know is the observation vector Y, O, actually, I forget the O, and the background vector X, B. So let's start with this assumption. And let's look at how we do it when we have only one observation. So basically, we're looking for the analysis at one observation point. Here, we're trying to estimate a scalar quantity at one point in space. We assume that we have a single observation. We also assume that we have a model forecast of this variable. So this is my observation. And this is my model forecast of the equivalent of this observation. And it's really simple, so I just assume that I can compare my model output to my observation. For instance, I'm observing the temperature at the middle of this room, but my model is also simulating the temperature at the middle of this room. So basically, it's straightforward to compare what the model tells me to what my measurement tells me. So I'm trying to find an analysis XA that is a linear combination of XB and y. So this linear combination is, I've turned it upside down a little bit because I want to, I really want to write that this difference between y and xb. But basically, it's still a linear combination of those two information. The big question is, how do I find k? And to figure out what k is, I need to consider the, in, the errors that are involved in this problem. So. If we're trying to figure out what the model is, uh, what the system is, some true uh, state of the, of the system does exist. I wish I knew it, but this is basically what I'm looking for. Um, and it's denoted by xt. So I'm going to squeeze in, in this equation. That is my assumption of what xa should look like. I'm going to squeeze xt uh, here and here 
and here and here. So basically, I end up with formulating my equation here with errors, epsilon a, epsilon b, and epsilon y. Epsilon a is the difference between the analysis and the true state of my system. The background is the difference the background error is the difference between my background state and the true state of the system. And my observation is the difference between the observation and the true state of the system. You can probably start to feel that in order to write this line here of epsilon y, I'm making some assumption because I'm making the assumption that I, that I really can compare the true state of my system to the observation. So probably I'm observing what the system really, really is. OK. Then, with these three error vectors here, you can rewrite this equation really easily. You can rewrite it in this form, right? If we have many realizations of these errors here, then you can compute an average. Just take the average of this equation here, and you have this guy here. So what, what do I mean by many realizations of these errors? Of course, there's the idea of these variables and this error being stochastic, stochastic errors. Um, there's only one where a representation of the true state of the system, of course, but there's, there are probably many um, background descriptions for my system. And there is also many observation description for my system. So you can think of many realization of these errors, either uh, because you have several models, but also because you have different time steps, because you have several observations. So you can compute this average here of the error. And this is, using this equation, we're going to be able to identify k. And if you look at the variance of this error, here, you see that k is really interfering here. One way to figure out k is to assume that we want the analysis error variance as low as possible. And you can kind of feel why I'm talking about minimum variance optimal here. So you're going to minimize this variance here with respect to k. So basically, you're going to compute the derivative to that line here with respect to k. And that is simply here. And to go from derivative of this with respect to k to that line, you need to assume that the errors in the background and the errors in the observation are uncorrelated. And that's a huge assumption in data simulation. And we will move on. We will keep developing the data, assimil the data assimilation algorithm ID uh, still using those, this assumption here. So, you assume you have this, this line here that is valid. And now you can easily identify k. And you see that it's a, a fraction. Uh, uh, on top of it, you have the, um, the background error uh, variance. So basically, i have using the sigma letter to denote the epsilon b. And the, on, um, at the bottom, you have the sum of the background error variance and the observation error variance. So basically, k is kind of a, um, a fraction between the uncertainty on the background and the sum of the uncertainty on the background and on the observation. So in some sense, it's like a barycentric um, formulation of, uh, of the analysis. But you, you put it the weight for your barycentric estimation are given by the description of the error variances. So what, what is it that we've done? We have derived, derived a weight k that produces a minimum analysis error variance. And this is because we have derivated the variance of the error analysis with respect to k. And this weight depends on the relative accuracy of the observation here, and the background here. So the, ex the limit uh, situation are the two following here. If the observation is perfect, then the observation error variance is 0, and then k is equal to 1. 
it basically means that you're not, basically you're driving your model towards the observation. The analysis is gonna be equal, equal to the observation because you just assume the observation is perfect. And whatever your model tells you, you can just trash it. The other extreme case is to assume that the background is perfect, meaning that the model, what the model tells you is perfect. It means that it has the, the, the error variance on your background is zero. It means that the, the K scalar is zero, and basically the analysis is equal to the background. It means that whatever you're observing, you're just not using it because you assume the uncertainty on whatever you're observing is too large. And that's why I'm saying the observation is ignored. So what we have here are two descriptions of the system that are linearly combined according to their accuracy. And basically, we keep that ID. So if you remember, I started, sorry, it takes long. I started this explanation assuming that we have one single observation, and that's why we only talked about variances. I'm no longer talking about background error matrices. Basically, I have one scalar for the background, I have one scalar for the observation, and my analysis is just a scalar. I'm looking, I'm, basically I'm using single observation, single model output, and so on. So there's no metrics, basically. It's just variances. But if I move on to multiple observation analysis, sorry, now we go back to vectors and matrices. Now we want to find the analysis at different locations. We go back to the situation where my model in this, to describe the temperature in this room is really describing the temperature at different locations in the room, following grid with a resolution that really has no, uh, no importance. And we also assume that we have uh, various uh, observation of the temperature in this room. So what we have now is the analysis vector XA as a linear combination of an observation vector and a priori background vector again. So that's the analysis vector, the background error, the, sorry, the background vector here, the observation vector here, and this is no longer a scalar uh, K. Now we have a matrix K. And it's the gain matrix, it's also the Kalman filter gain matrix. And it is defined as B multiplied by the sum of B and R inversed. Where B is the background error covariance matrix and R is the observation error covariance matrix. If you look at this equation, it's really similar to what I had here. This is the B matrix, but it's reduced to a scalar because we have only one point. This is, again, the B matrix reduced to, to the variance. And this is the air matrix reduced to the variance. If, if we now have vectors, you just replace those variances by the covariance matrices. Um, but again, you could, sorry, you can really write this equation, figure out what K is writing the variance of the error epsilon a, just like I, I, I did the mass before on the single point case, you can really rewrite the same mass and minimize the, the variance of the, of the analysis, and you end up with this formulation of the gain matrix here. And so this weight here is determined such that it gives the minimum variance of the estimate xa. So we'll look at it with an example. We were trying to find the analysis at two different locations by assimilating two observations. So I really now have an analysis vector. Well, it's a small vector, but yeah, it's a vector. So it's xA at grid point one and xA at grid point two. The model provides you with some description of your state uh, for point one and point two also, and you have also two observations. So what's in the B matrix now? The B matrix is the background error covariance matrix. So first you have to compute the errors. So that's the difference between XB here and the true state of your system. Of course, if you're gonna compute the difference between XB and XT, 
that better be expressed at the model grid point. So you have to express your truth, your xt vector, on the grid, uh, on the model grid, so that you can actually compute the error. Uh, so when I talk about the, the true state, I'm actually talking about a, the discretized true state on the grid of, of your model. Uh, so assuming you have formulating the errors between the true state and the background, you're able to figure out what the variance of these errors is at grid point number one, and the variance of this error at grid point number two. And you can also specify the correlation between error at the location one and the location two. R is the correlation coefficient between the error at one location on your model and the other location uh, of your model. Basically, if you know that your model is off by, I don't know, two degrees, you know that at the uh, neighboring grid point, it's wrong by mm. one degree, for instance, or by two degrees because the correlation coefficient is just one. And to describe that, it's you don't really know what to put in there, and uh, we'll, we'll talk some more about that in one of the next sessions. But it, it, you kind of already feel that it's hard to describe those statistics because I'm telling you to compute the difference between the background and the true state. But the true state is basically what we're looking for. We're, we're looking for an optimal uh, estimate of this true state. So. We don't know it. Basically, you're not able to compute the difference between the background and the true state. So when I tell you compute the difference, compute the variance of this error, or compute the covariance of the coalition, well, OK, that's a really nice idea. That's a beautiful idea. That's really what I want to put in B. But in real life, I can't do that. Or if I can do that, it's because I know the truth on my system. So it makes no sense to do data assimilation. So, we assume we have some description of these errors for now, because, uh, and then we'll try to figure out what we really know on these errors and what we put in here. But in theory, this is what we put in here, the variance for the background error and the covariances for the background error. All right, uh, you had a question? Okay, so you think, you, well, this one? Okay. No, no, that's okay. Um, so yeah, you have two observations now. So instead of the variance error observation that I was mentioning before, now you have a um, observation error covariance matrix. All right, and basically that's the description of the the statistical description of the uncertainty on your observation. For instance, you have a thermometer that will measure the temperature in this room with an uncertainty of one degree. So the variance is one degree, okay? And you have two, two thermometers in this room, so you have two observations of the temperature. One thermometer may have a variance of one, one degree squared, and the other thermometer is a little bit more uncertain, and it may have um, a variance uh, of, uh, I don't know, four uh, degrees squared, okay? So this is the first variance error and the second variance error. You can assume that all your thermometers have the same variances, okay? Especially if you're using a, if you're using a, um, a satellite, the errors um, are described for all the observations. And one major assumption that I'm doing here in this simplified case is that the errors for the observation at location one is not correlated to the error at observation at location two. Basically, the error on my thermometer number one is not correlated to the error on my thermometer number two. It kind of makes sense, except if you buy those two thermometers in the same store, for instance. And I don't know, they had some storing problem and all the thermometers are off by something. But if you have some description of the correlation between 
those observation errors, if it's realistic that they exist, this is where they should kick in. All right? Does that answer your question? OK, you're welcome. OK. So you can write the mass. I'm not going to do it on the board. Uh, but you really end up with this formulation uh, where alpha 1 is the ratio between the observation error variance, I'm assuming those variances are equal at point 1 and 2, and the background error variance at location 1, and alpha 2 is the equivalent for point 2. So you end up with a matrix here, and you have the correlation from the background, oops, sorry, I've lost the pointer, here, that kicks in here, and also in the, in the B plus R inverse. Um, when you move on to vectors of three dimension and n dimension, you clearly don't want to write the math. But so far, you see that the B matrix is a two by two matrix, the R matrix is a two by two matrix, and you really, K is, for now, in this case, sorry, a two by two matrix, but basically um, it, it's going to be a rectangular matrix that has the dimension of observation versus uh, control space. I'm afraid the pointer is getting weaker and weaker. I'll just use the, the mouse instead. C'est pas grave, c'est noir. Okay. Un petit peu, ouais. Enfin, il n'y a pas de, pas de problème. If we assume that there is no correlation between what the model says at location one and location two, so R is zero, you back to a, simple, a simpler case where in the Kalman gain, there is no um, off-diagonal terms. As in the scalar case, the observation and background are combined um, according to the relative accuracy, but it's more than just accuracy. It's really the it also it, you also have into account the correlations, the cor the error correlations, and when the correlation increases, then the weight of an observation at the first point on the analysis at the second point increases. It means that if I'm observing here, and I know that there is a strong correlation between the error here and the error there, I can. I know that when I'm sort of observing here, I'm off by two degrees, and if the model error is really correlated between here and there, it makes sense to add up two degrees here, but also two degrees there. If I know, on the other hand, that the model error in my model is really not correlated, if I know that I have, I'm off by two degrees here, I have no idea what to do there, because I just said that the errors in my model were uncorrelated. So my observation here is just useful for here. If I want to correct there, I need to observe there. I'll go back to what's in B and R, and R, but I hope you have some sense of what to put in there from now. So now we move on to the general formulation of the, of the minimum variance approach equation. So we look for an analysis xA, still it's a linear combination of an observation vector y and a priori background vector xB. And now we have to take into account the observation operator h. Because the simpler case that I was using before is no longer uh, realistic. It's not real to assume that my model is simulating the state of my system at the observation point. It's nonsense. So you have to find a way to move from the background model state to the observation state so that you can really compute the difference between whatever the model tells you and whatever the observation tells you. And if you write the math, just like we did before, then you see that the gain matrix, or the weight uh, k, is defined by this matrix multiply where B is the background error covariance matrix we've talked about, R is the observation operator, uh, sorry, R is the observation error covariance matrix, and now you have H that is the linear model of the observation operator. So just let me explain a bit. H can be a nonlinear relation. It can be a linear relation as well. Let me just illustrate that idea. 
The observation is here in the middle of the room. My model is simulating the temperature everywhere. I want to compare what the model tells me in terms of temperature to whatever my thermometer tells me. What do I need? I have an observation here. Am I going to average my model output and then compare it to the observation? Or should I just extract whatever the model says uh, at the location, the closest uh, location to my thermometer and compute the difference? Or another solution would be to take the four closest points on my model grid and do the bilinear interpolation at the observation point and then compare this interpolated temperature to the, obs to the observed temperature? Or should I just extract one significant a point of the model output and then compare it to the observation? Well, th there's not really right answer for this simple example, but H is really telling you how, how do I move from whatever the model tells me to whatever the observation tells me. And in this example, since I, I'm, I, I'm saying that I'm controlling the model state, the temperature, for my example, it's not that difficult because you may have to do some spatial interpolation. It could be linear or not. It's not really the, 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 the question. But now try to think that we're correcting some, mo some model parameters. So X is no longer the gridded temperature simulated by the model. Now it's the diffusion coefficient. So I want to compare whatever knowledge I have on my diffusion coefficient, so that XB, to the temperature in the middle of the room. Why do I have to do that? First, I need to run the model. I need to uh, simulate the temperature uh, with the model using my background diffusion coefficient. And then I go, I'm, I'm, again, ending up with a gridded model output that I need to compare to the located observation. So I need to do my um, bilinear interpolation, for instance. But in H, in the case where X is the model parameter, now I have the model integration in time or whatever, and then this spatial selection. So in that second example, H can be really nonlinear because the physics of a model with respect to its model, uh, to its parameters, uh, is really often nonlinear. So you can see that this operator here, it's not bold, it's not a matrix because it's a nonlinear operator. And if you're going to com compute the analysis variance and minimize it, you have to write a gradient. And when you write, just, this is actually what we did here. When you, when you move on from the analysis variance formulation to the minimization, here you're basically computing the gradient of this, of this line with respect to K. Well, you do the same with the matrices. And that's here. And to compute the gradient, you need the gradient of this linear operator. And this is what uh, H, the bold H, uh, denotes here. So it's the linear model of the observation operator. It can be really easy and can be really tricky. It really depends on what you're controlling and what you're observing. And of course, HT is the transpose. Uh, then again, we've moved on to uh, n dimension now. The weight k is determined such that it gives a minimum variance of the estimate. The assumption has not changed. All right. Um, this equation, this one here, with the formulation of k here, is called the blue analysis. So that's the best linear unbiased estimator. You will really see this uh, name if you look at the literature for data assimilation as a starting point for all the um, books, papers, or so on. Um, it's important to have this equation in mind because you will see that it relates to the variational algorithm. You will see that it relates to the Kalman filter equation. And basically, it, it is the Kalman filter analysis equation. We have to do some major assumptions to write the blue equation. So the first one is that we're using a linear observation operator. This guy here, 
We are assuming it's linear, at least locally, because we are able to derive its linear model. So it means that the variation of the observation operator in the vicinity of the background state or model parameters, uh, the background model parameter, is linear for any close enough neighboring to be. Uh, so that's a major assumption. We also assume that B and R are positive definite matrices, but that's, that's a classical assumption. We assume that we have unbiased error. This is why we have unbiased here. Um, and we assume that we have uncorrelated errors. And I've mentioned that point a while ago um, here. That kicks in, basically, when you compute the derivative of the variance error analysis with respect to K. If you want to come down to this easy uh, gradient formulation, you have to get rid of this cross correlation terms between the background error and the observation error. So this is where you have to make that assumption. Uh, our starting point was that we're looking for a linear analysis. We look for an analysis defined by correction to the background, which depends linearly on background, obs background observation departure. Okay, so that uh, should have changed the vocabulary, but it depends on the background and a correction to the background, the difference between the observation and the background. And uh, we we'll look for an analysis that is as close as possible to the true state in the sense of the minimum variance estimate. And why? Because we have minimized, we have computed the, the, we have computed the variance of the analysis and minimized the discussed function. Okay, that, so basically what we've derivated so far is the blue equation under the linearized assumption. Okay? You're still alive? Cool. <laughs> Has anybody heard about the blue equation or the Kalman filter equation before or? No? Okay. <laughs> well, you, yeah. <laughs> I know some of you have. <laughs> okay. Um, in the next slide, I'm trying to help you really picture what is in these matrices, especially the observation operator, because it's, it's a tricky one and it really depends on what you want to control. So I'm trying to illustrate uh, what's in this matrix. And in my example where I had a, a size two vec background vector and a size two observation vector, it wasn't really helping because it kind of looks like all the matrices were squared, which is true for the background error various uh, matrices, but not for H. So let's, let's just have a closer look at the observation operator. So I told you it described the equivalent of the control, either parameter or model state, in the observation state. So the control vector is X, the observation equivalent is Y, and this operator can be nonlinear, especially when controlling model parameter. I just explained that. So if you assume that Y, the observation vector, is of size P, basically you have P observation in this room, and the size of your control vector is N, then your H operator is a matrix, if you assume it's linear, that is of size P, by x. Basically, you, you have to multiply h, h by x, so you don't really have choice. You have to write up a matrix that you can multiply by h, and you end up in the observation vector space. So the first column is going to be multiplied by the first term of x and so on. And this is really, um, I mean, we're really doing a linear assumption here. And you end up formulating these matrices when you're doing a, lin a local linear assumption and de derivate the Jacobian of this operator when it's nonlinear. So here you have either the linear observation operator, straightforward, or you have to write the Jacobian matrix of this guy here. So you're going to have to compute the gradient of this nonlinear operator with respect to each element of the control of x to compute this guy here. It's the linear model 
of the observation aperture, but it's linear with respect to whatever I'm looking for, and that's x. I'm looking for the optimal analysis xa. So basically, you have a p by n matrix for this guy. And if it's not linear in the beginning, you have to write its linearized form. So you have to do that either manually, because you have a code and you're going to basically write the, the Fortran code or whatever, the C code or whatever you want, uh, for each line of your model, you're going to have to write it. Or you can use some tools, for instance, an automatic auto-differentiation software, or you have to um, numerically compute the, the derivative, for instance, using a finite difference scheme. But if you have, in either way, if, if you have to write this, this gain here, you just have no way around. You have to compute the linear model of the observation operator. All right. Um, I'm done with the minimum variance ID, and I will try to uh, show you how it relates to other optimal uh, estimate that you can find in the literature. So an alternative way to define the, the analysis it is to think of it as the maximum of a, a posteriori PDF of the state, given the observation and the background. So the crucial idea here is that the control uh, user state or um, parameter is a stochastic variable, and you can provide a PDF for that. You assume that the background is also a stochastic variable, the observation is a stochastic variable, and you have some PDF for this guy. And the analysis here is really the maximum of the probability of having x knowing y, that's the observation, and xb. It's really the same idea. You have y, you have your observation, whatever the observation tells you, and you have xb, whatever the model tells you. And you're looking for xa, that's the most probable, the, 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 the state with a higher probability or the parameter with a higher probability of occurrence, knowing those information. So if you use the bias rule on this uh, maximum, org maximum expression, you have this probability here, and if you use the fact that p of y, of, of having y and xb is not a function of x, because whatever you're observing, you're observing. It does not depend on whatever background you're using on your model. You can basically simplify this guy, and, you, and also using that observation and background error are uncorrelated, you can basically replace this guy here by the multiplication of the probability of having y knowing x and the probability of having b, uh, xp knowing x. So you end up with here, this guy here, basic, sorry. You replace this one here, the, pro the, oh, sorry, the probability of having x knowing y and xp by the multiplication of having y knowing x and having xb knowing x. And this is really what we know. We have the observation, knowing x, and we have the background knowing x, and you're looking for x. So you have, a, you can define a cost function uh, using the log of those, P, those multiplied PDF and a constant, um, and you can derivate this cost function with respect to x, and you end up looking for the minimum of this cost function. Okay? So the constant is gonna just uh, disappear. And now you have to make an assumption. What am I going to put in these PDFs here, this conditional PDF? I have to make some decision. So an easy decision in mass is just assume everything is Gaussian. So I'm going to assume that the distribution for my stochastic variable, either it's the background or the observation error, is Gaussian. So I can write this conditional PDF here as an exponential. It has the difference between x and xb inside. You recognize the background error covariance matrix here that I've used before, um, here and also here. So that's for xb. And for y, you recognize the uh, observation error covariance matrix r here and here. 
And of course, to kind of compare y and x, I still need the observation operator here. So basically, whether I'm formulating the, the analysis as the minimum variance or as the maximum likelihood optimal, I still need the same tools, the same knowledge on the background and observation error statistics. Those covariance matrices are, are still needed, and the link between the observation space and the control space is still needed. You still need the observation operator. Um, what else? Then you end up with writing this cost function, basically, if you replace those um, PDF, conditional PDF multiply here by the exponential and take the log, you end up with whatever remains in the parentheses, basically. And you recognize the cost function that I wrote at the very beginning of this lecture. Well, I hope you do. It had uh, blue stars and green dots and red squares and so on. It was kind of an easy word. Uh, but now you know what's behind this. And of course, you want to minimize that cost function. So if you want to minimize that cost function, you're going to uh, write the gradient. And if you write the gradient of that cost function and uh, say it's equal to zero, you are solving the 3D var variational approach methods. <coughs> so basically, we, are, uh, we have moved from just writing a linear combination of whatever we know on our system, assuming some optimal criteria, is a minimum variance of maximum likelihood criteria. Uh, and the answer is either uh, the Kalman, the, the gain formula, but also the cost function formulation. And it, it, we, we also, we, we, in both cases, we made similar assumption we end up to variational formulation or matrix multiply formulation with the same assumption. Uh, what's next? OK, so you're going to write the gradient of this guy here. So I'm not sure this is useful for this audience here, but here is a reminder of how to write a gradient for the, um, the matrix multiply um, forms. So you use those basic rules that you probably know, and you write the gradient, you set it to zero, and you end up with this equation that we've seen already. Um, and this is the K matrix that we have written already. So you end up with the same solution as the minimum variance solution. Let me just give you some vocabulary here. Uh, in, the, um, in the following, this difference here is called the innovation. And you may remember that a couple of slides uh, ago, uh, I mentioned this, this word. Well, the innovation vector is just the vector of, dif of difference between the observation and the background translated in the observation space. Uh, well, so, I will try, just try to emphasize the limits of the formulation that we have seen so far, especially the limits of the matrix formulation. You may remember that uh, I mentioned that in meteorology and ocean, we have really big systems. The models have really high, uh, fine resolution, high resolution. There are a whole bunch of observations, so all the x, y vectors are huge, and the b and r matrices are huge matrices. And so far, I've spent a lot of time telling you that you have to multiply vectors by matrices, matrices by matrices, inverting matrices, and that means expressing those matrices and storing those matrices. Uh, if the matrix is uh, 10 to the power of 6 by 10 to the power of 6, you may not want to do that, especially with MATLAB. So um, you may look for an implementation that it's easier on you when you have a big system than if you have a small system, because if this guy is a set of 10 parameters uh, and you have two observations, then really, you're really good to go. There's no need for looking for something more advanced. But if this is 10 to the power of 6 and this is 10 to the power of um, 6 also, uh, you're not going to do the math. So formulating the background and observation error covariance is really not easy. We have a section on that later on. And the control vector and the observation vector are also really large. 
And it's really hard to store and to multiply those vectors and matrices, and also to invert. You can also uh, get into real trouble um, with H. And usually, for a large system, you don't really formulate the B, R, and H as matrices. You formulate as operator that you apply to X. So instead of multiplying uh, B by X, you apply some operator, some function, some analysis function, um, analytical function, or um, co coded function to a vector X, and it makes it really easy in terms of implementation. So the matrix formulation that we have really derivated so far is well adapted to small dimension problems. Well, the key question is what is small, what is large, and you're not going to decide if your system is small and large. This is just your system, and you have to deal with it. You may try to reduce your system, the unknown on your system, but basically, if you have a large dimension problem, well, you have a large dimension problem, and you have to find some adapted algorithm for that. Uh, and also, the, the question of what is small and what is large really depends on on what, which, which type of computer you're doing your, your application. If you're doing it on your laptop, a large is probably small compared to if you're working on a, a supercomputer um, on a supercomputer center. So it really depends on your problem and your, your, resource, your resources, and you have to find an adapted algorithm to solve your, your, your own um, um, case. Uh, maybe it's a good time to take a break, and I'll drink some water, <laughs> and we'll come back to, I don't know, how long? Uh, 11. Oh, OK, so a minute break, OK. OK. Um, you may have some questions uh, that we want to discuss here or during the break, or you can ask questions before you forget them, or <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> so do you have questions? Sure. So uh, All these things are new for me, but uh, there is uh, something I'm not sure to understand, because in the maximum uh, likelihood function with a log, mm -hmm. It seems you have an extra assumption of uh, Gaussian uh, distribution. Whereas in the first model, it seems that you have less assumption and you get in the end the same uh, uh, filter. So how is it? Um, the fact that you're assuming that you're describing your background and your observation with covariance matrices, and covariance matrices alone it's because you're making a Gaussian assumption. If, you, if the higher moments were important, you would not, the, the PDF of X, B, and Y would not be sufficiently well described by just the, the mean, the variance, and the covariance. You would need something else. So basically, in the um, matrix formulation, you really have the same assumption that's underlying. It's just the fact that I'm saying all, all I need is covariance matrix. Well, maybe not. If I'm not, if I don't have the Gaussian assumption, I need more than that. Other questions? Okay. So let's thank uh, Sophie and uh, go back at <laughs> eleven. Okay. So we'll start again. So if you have a question, comments, uh, they're welcome. Otherwise, I'll move on to more cost functions uh, writing. <laughs> so we've seen the classical algorithm, and um, I've tried to explain the differences and similarities between the matrix formulation approach and the variational, the cost function approach. Now we will focus on the variational, the cost function um, approach, and especially I will talk a bit about time, and this is a question that I, that I had, and especially how you deal with the, obso the observation that are uh, temporally distributed over time, so we, we'll talk a bit about that. Um, I also have a um, section four on error covariance estimation and modeling, because as I mentioned already, 
uh, it's a really nice idea to say that we should describe the statistics of the errors with respect to the true states, but it's a tricky, it's a tricky point. Uh, and then the last section, the section five, is like is two slides with a, a list of uh, of references. Sorry, the list of references for you to learn more on data estimation if you're willing to. Um, okay, so let's go back to our cost function formulation. Uh, we have mentioned that the cost function formulated so far is called 3D var. So you may wonder why 3D. The, the answer is quite easy. The 3D var corresponds to the three dimension in space for x because uh, if you assume that your control vector is uh, represents a field for your model. Usually it's a 3D field, especially in meteorology, oceanography. But if you think of it in, let's say, hyd river hydraulics, where you solve the, the dynamic of your river with a 1D model, then the model discretized your water level along the flow. It's just 1D mod model. Well, you still use the 3D var method, but you don't have 3D in your model, you just have 1D. So basically, the, the name of the variational methods is 3D var uh, because it allows you to take up to three dimensions that are the spatial dimensions. If you move on to 4D var, then you add up the time. So in the 3D var, you assume that the observations are distributed in space, but you're working at a single point in time. And this is, well, I see that. Maybe there's a question here? Yes, because you have a model over time, right? I'm sorry? You have a model over time. Yes, OK, let me just clarify. Um, I can go back to uh, previous. Oh, I should not be doing that. Okay, let's go back to my. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a while ago. <laughs> OK. Is this what you have in mind? Yes. OK. So your model is evolving in time. That's totally true. But you, are, you can compute your analysis at one fixed time. And that's here. Your data simulation stuff is done at one time. And then you use whatever you're correcting either the initial condition or the model parameter to integrate your model forward in time. But data assimilation is not dealing with time. Next, next time you're going to worry about data assimilation is at this time. But it's also a fixed time. See? So the observations are distributed in space and time. But if you think of it, as I am the data assimilation algorithm and I am seeing an observation vector, I'm only working at a specific time and all my observations for this analysis are now. And that's it. And this is what the 3D var is doing. I'm using all my observations now, correcting, then my model is taking me to some, to some other time, and then I'm doing data assimilation again. Okay? So this is 3D var. Let me go back to here the extension the extension from 3d var to 4d var is that data assimilation is dealing itself with the temporality of our system and instead of working with observation at one um, time step you're dealing with uh, several observation in time. And this is why you have a sum here in the, in the observation part of the cost function. And basically, you compare the observation vector yj, uh, j is time, uh, with whatever the model tells you over time. So this is the initial condition at the beginning of a time window. You have to integrate the model over time to describe what the model uh, simulates over time. You extract whatever you need to extract in order to 
be comparable to the observation in time. And then you have a sum of those differences in your cast function. And in both cases, you can think of it as I am correcting my model state. Here in the 3D var, I'm correcting my model state now. And in the 4D var, I am correcting the model state, the model state x as the initial condition for my model to fit with the observation over a given period of time. I have a schematic uh, in the next slide, and I hope it will be uh, clearer. Um, so the, the big question is, how am I um, really going to minimize this cost function, or this one, as I have nonlinear um, operators in here, this guy here, and this guy here that has the dynamic of the model. This is the, the temporally evolving model here. And if I'm going to write the gradient of this cost function with respect to x, basically this is coming down to writing the tangent linear of my model with respect to its initial condition or to its parameter if I want to control, to, I want to control the parameter. So you see that you may have a non-quadratic uh, cost function here, and especially here, and it's not easy to, to, to minimize. So in the variational approach, you're doing that iteratively. So let me first go back to this time question. Um, this is what we do with the 3D var case. The analysis is given is achieved at a given time t. Let's say this is one hour slices here. And you have observation every five minutes of the temperature in this room. The observation are here. I'm sorry, the observations are here. And I, I'm going to do my analysis as, at fixed times, not over a time window. So what I'm going to do is say, OK, I have four observations of the temperature. I'm going to compare that to whatever my model says at this time here. So I kind of, I'm cheating, actually. And I'm saying, this observation was done an hour ago, but I'm comparing it to my model now. And this observation was made, um, is going to be made in the future, but I will compare it to my model now. So I'm kind of cheating and saying that all my observations that are made over time are not really made over time. They're all made now. And I'm then able to compute an analysis at one time. And this is the 3D bar. And then I say, OK, um, I have gathered all my observations during one hour. I have done an analysis. I have a new initial condition or parameter or whatever I need. I can integrate my model for next, up to the next analysis time. So between here and here, there is no data assimilation. And next time I will do uh, data assimilation is once I have gathered all my observation to my analysis time. So my if my observations are distributed in time, I kind of not take that into account when I compare observation to my model and, to my, uh, and when I compute the analysis. All right? So of course, I'm doing data assimilation over time because I'm cycling my analysis. I'm using my observation as they keep coming. But in the process, in the cost function formulation, I'm assuming all those observations are fixed in time, slice by slice. Okay? If you really push it to an extreme, you can think of it as, I, am, I have observed my system for 10 days, and I am going to do an analysis at one time. Let's say you want to correct the parameter. You, you, you assume that your model is not really varying in time, which is probably non-realistic, and you pretend that your observations were all made now, even though they were made over 10 days and you just compute one analysis. Well, this is not something you should be doing, I guess. So usually you kind of cycle it. OK, so this is 3D var. In the 4D var, this is an analysis window, an analysis time window, and you have observations that are distributed over time, and you really compare this observation to whatever the model tells you with its temporal dynamic at, uh, at the proper time. And you compute this sum here 
of differences. But in order to do that, you have to provide a background trajectory. So let me describe this graph that is quite important and use the pointer again. OK, so this is time. And this is, well, whatever variable you're interested in, or let's say temperature, it doesn't really matter. The observation are the black dots here. And I'm going to talk about cycles. And basically, a cycle is a time window over which you're performing a data simulation analysis. Basically, a time window is defined from g is equal to 0 to g is equal to n. So during a time window, you have a couple of observations. This is t0 and tn. That's the first cycle of assimilation. And that's the second cycle of assimilation, and so on. So for the first cycle, let's say three hours, you have uh, an initial condition uh, for your model. You integrate your model forward in time. That's the background trajectory here in black solid line. You can compare this trajectory to whatever the observation tells you. So you basically compute the difference between this observation here, the observed temperature in this room, and the simulated temperature in this room at this time. You also compute the difference between the, uh, the second observation in time, I'm not talking about space, uh, and what the model says at this time, and so on for those four observations. You add that up in the sum, in the cost function that you saw before, so you add up those discrepancies. Um, of course, you need this R matrix. This is still on. And you minimize the cost function, and you identify the initial condition at the beginning of this three hours time window that will allow, that will allow your model to describe a trajectory that has a better fit with the observation than the background trajectory. Is that clear? Or I can do it again. Should I do it again? Yes? I have one yes. It's a good enough reason to do it again. I have two yes. OK. <laughs> this is time. But you can scream when, you're, when, when everything has understood. You can, <laughs> you can say it. I'll stop talking. Uh, you have integrated your model over time. It gives you some description, the background description of the dynamic of your model over three hours. And you start it from some initial condition. You just assume you have an initial condition, the background initial condition. And you have then the background trajectory. We are trying to control the state of my model and the state of, of my model at the beginning of this time window. I'm trying to correct the initial condition over three hours. Because when I have a better initial condition, let's say this one, I am able to integrate the model over three hours, and then I'm able to run a forecast. And I'm really interested in having a better forecast forward in time. So if I have a good initial condition, I will have a better fit to my observation for the period over which I have observation, and I will also be able to integrate the model forward in time. Because at, at some point, you, you don't have that. At some point, this is the future, OK? Uh, this is a schematic view, but at some point, you stop having observation and you want to forecast. OK, so I have a background trajectory, and I'm trying to correct the initial point for this background trajectory. For that, I compare my background trajectory of the model to some observations that are distributed in time, and also in space. But I mean, this, is, this has not changed. Um, and given those discrepancies between each observation in time and space and the model equivalent, I can write my cost function. So this is this part here. I'm comparing observations that are distributed in time with whatever the model says over time. So I have used my initial condition at the beginning of my three hours. I have integrated my dynamical model. Then I have extracted the space stuff, the interpolation <coughs> problem that I mentioned before, so that I can compute the difference between observation and whatever the model says over time and space. And then I have this sum here, and I have 
the integrality of my cost function, then I'm good to minimize it. Better? Okay. Now, I have talked about initial condition. But I could also talk about model parameter. Assume that x is the model parameter <coughs> over this time window. I, I use this background model parameter, some knowledge that I have some previous whatever information. I integrate the model background trajectory with this first guess parameter. I compare the background trajectory to whatever observation I have over time and space. I write the cost function. I minimize the cost function. I end up with the <coughs> updated model parameter. And then I use this model parameter again to integrate, again, my model over time. So since I'm only correcting the model parameter, well, probably this gray dot here is the same as this black dot here, because I have not changed the initial condition. Now I'm saying I'm controlling the parameter. So this trajectory will probably start from here. But it will then differ because I have changed some model parameters. And then I can integrate it forward in time. OK? And I can do that over a three hours time window. And then I can do the same sequentially over another three hour time window when I have new observation for the next three hours. And then I move forward in time. And every three hours, I'm able to issue a forecast. It can be a two-hour forecast. It can be a six-hour, a 12-hour, a 20-day forca forecast. And every three hours, I'm able to run that forecast. So basically, r uh, sequentially applying data assimilation allows you to provide a curve of different, set, uh, different points over time for, for for one lead time forecast or whatever you want for your forecast. OK? So the question now is really, how am I going to solve this uh, cost function? Just one point uh, uh, I want to mention before moving on. So far, what we have put in the cost function is the discrepancy between whatever background I had and <coughs> my control. I'm sorry, the, the, the O here is not really useful. It should be X. So the, dif the difference between X and XP, so you've seen that before, the difference between whatever the model says and the observation vector. But there is also, if you talk about weak constraint uh, data assimilation, there's also another type of error that you, should, that you could take into account is really the model error as you integrate it forward in time. So this is something I want to mention. I won't really take time to go into details. But if you look at the literature, you will see that you have another a third term. You can have a third term in the cost function uh, if you assume that your model is not perfect. And it's true. I mean, your model is not perfect. It's not just the initial condition that it's wrong. It's not just the model parameter that it's wrong. It, when you integrate a perfect initial condition over time with your model, you don't have a perfect state that gets described by your model because the model itself is wrong. It, sorry, not perfect, not wrong. <laughs> but, um, so really, we should be taking that into account. For instance, your model is probably biased. Maybe when I compute the temperature in this room, because I have a bug in my model, um, I have maybe uh, 10 degrees. I'm 10 degrees off every day. And well, first thing I do is debug the code. But uh, if your model is just biased for some reason, well, you have to take that into account in, in your data assimilation process. Since this is really tricky, we usually don't do it. And we keep sequentially correcting the model state and correcting it again, like keeping holding the model's hand and helping him staying on the right trajectory, even though the model is biased, for instance. So you kind of use the model parameter and the model initial condition to really uh, constrain the model to stay on a realistic trajectory. But it will be really helpful if we were able to correct the bias. 
Uh, okay, I'm not saying this, this is not done in the literature. There's a whole bunch of uh, people working on that. It's implemented for some operational system. There's a lot of research on that. So uh, please don't uh, conclude that this should not be taken into account. It's just uh, in order to simplify the, the math and the explanation that I'm giving today, we are usually assuming that the model is perfect and that the Q matrix is uh, no, no longer necessary. So this was the weak constraint for the bar, 3D bar and so on, and what we've seen so far is the strong constraint for the bar. So I'll just go back and forget about this. Sorry for people who spend their life on that, but not today. <laughs> so back to what we've seen before. Um, we have a nonlinear weighted least square pro problem, and it is nonlinear because of M, this is the model integration, and because of H, this is the operator observation. So I really want to minimize that with respect to the initial condition X or the model parameter, also X. So what I'm going to do is solve um, this minimization with a trunk truncated, sorry, Gauss-Newton algorithm. And this is known as incremental 4 in the in the data assimilation community. And basically, you're going to rewrite this cost function that is non-quadratic as a, as a sequence, as a, as a sequence yeah, of, a, of a quadratic <laughs> approximation. So basically, you write the linear approximation of this operator around the background state or the background set of parameter um, using uh, just a simple Taylor decomposition of this operator. So the combination of the combination of M and H is denoted by J, and this is where those notation gets all messed up and so on because um, the observation operator is also denoted by generalized observation operator when it includes the model dynamic. So when I was talking about the observation operator helping you going from, I have an observation here, and the model uh, gives me the temperature everywhere, and this is bilinear interpolation, blah, blah, blah. This is basically H, and this is not really nonlinear. This could be bilinear interpolation, or okay, you can go with spleen, you can go with, but it's not by itself really strongly nonlinear, and, it, and if it is, it's no big deal. But if you need to integrate the model, well, usually the dynamic of the model with respect to whatever you want to control, either the initial condition or the model parameter, is really nonlinear. And then the composition of M and H is really a nonlinear observation operator, and this is why we call it the generalized, and this is where the G comes from, uh, observation operator. So I'm sorry for the mix in the notation, but this is the reason why we have H and G. So basically, you need to compute the Jacobian of G, and so you have a reference state, like the, the initial, um, point where you start your linear, linear approximation and you, will, you have nothing but the background, so you do the linearization around the background state or parameter, and then you have the Jacobian matrix, the, the gradient matrix of the observation operator that is computed around the background state. Is there a problem with that? Or? So basically you have to compute the derivative of the model output with respect to the control vector, okay? And you have a Jacobian matrix here that you're going to use. So you squeeze that, you, you replace this by this in this cost function. And what you really need to do is also write the control vector as an increment. So basically what we are looking for is no longer the model space or the model parameter, but now we're, t we're living in a world of anomalies where the control is the correction to the, con to, to the initial condition or the correction to the model, state, uh, model parameters, sorry. Because we, are, we have linearized our physics. So now we're minimizing with respect to delta x, which is the difference between x and xb. 
And this is the delta x that we have used in the, in the Taylor expansion here. And you squeeze all those guys in here. And if we just change slide, you end up with this quadratic cost function. And it, it is quadratic with respect to delta x. Okay? This is my new control vector. I'm looking for a correction to something. I'm not looking for a new something. And of course, you still have a g of x that needs to be computed. You still need to compare the model trajectory to, the, to your observation. You need to compute the innovation vector. And this, you still need to compute those discrepancies. I mean, this is the source of information. So you still need to integrate your, your model. Sorry, where was I? Here. But still the function, the cost function is quadratic with respect to delta x. And you can compute that. That's not a big problem. So from now on, you need to define the innovation vector that I mentioned a couple of times before. And it's the difference between the observation and the model uh, background trajectory. So that's the vector d. And of course, you have observations that are distributed over time and space. So you put them all together in a, in a, huge, in a huge vector. You have the Jacobian matrix of uh, J. And this is time. So you, you may have a Jacobian matrix that evolves in time like you have here. And R, well, it's still the same. It's just that you have to worry about describing the error uh, statistics that may evolve in time. So for time one uh, up to n. Well, you may have simpler, simpler cases where you don't really know the statistics of your error, of the statistics of your observation error that well. So you just assume you don't, they don't evolve in time. But still, you need that huge matrix. Uh, as for the background, it's, uh, the time doesn't really kick in because what we're looking for is a correction to the initial condition or a correction to the model parameter. So time it does not interfere in here, and the B matrix is similar to what we've seen before. OK, so now this is cool because we have a, a pointer that works cool. Um, we have a quadratic function, and we know how to solve that. So basically, uh, the non-quadratic cost function is solved as a iterative, uh, with an iterative method of a linear subproblem. You start at k is equal to zero. You choose an initial vector. Well, usually you have nothing but the background. You just start from here. You linearize your problem around the background. So you have this cost function. You minimize it with your best friend's minimizer. I don't know. You, there's a whole bunch that are available. Um, and then you end up with an optimal delta x at iteration, well, I was at iteration 0. You correct the model state or the parameters, and you recompute the, the non-quadratic cost function. You re for that, you have to integrate your model again, and then you choose a new uh, point around which you're going to linearize. So of course, that's the, the update here. You linearize your problem again, so you have to recompute the Jacobian matrix here, and you solve it again, and you do that iteratively until it doesn't move, it doesn't move anymore, and you have convergence. Usually in real life, you don't wait until the convergence. You do it maybe three to five times, and after that, your meteorological model or ocean model is really too expensive, and you cannot uh, pay that price anymore, so you just stop. But basically, that's the idea. <coughs> Sorry. You had a nonlinear problem, and then you have an iterative uh, suite of a quadratic problem. So this illustration here. <coughs> Sorry. This is the non-quadratic cost function. Um, in order to find its minimum that is here, you start with the first quadratic formulation here, because that was your first background. You minimize this guy. You find this minimum. Uh, and then you, really, you linearize again, and that's this one here around 
the, the, the first uh, analysis, no, that's this one, sorry. Uh, you find the, the new minimum, and then you write another quadratic function, that's the third one here. You minimize this guy, and then you reintegrate your model again, and then you formulate the last quadratic function. And in this perfect uh, example, well, the, the minimum of the fourth quadratic uh, cost function is the real minimum of my non-quadratic solution, but in real life, well, uh, nothing tells you that you have to do it four times and you may not end up with the really the good minimum of your non-quadratic function, but you can iterate that if you, if you have the computational resources to do so. Uh, but that's the way, that's the way it's, uh, it's done in the variational algorithm. Um, okay. Well, I've explained that already. So th there's one point I want to emphasize here is, and it's when, when you solving the quadratic cost function, you basically need to solve that linearized subproblem. Uh, you basically need to minimize this function here, and you need to write its gradient with respect to delta x. And when you do that, the problem is not so much the first part that relates to the background because it's really simple. It's this guy here. Well, your only problem is that you, you have to inverse the B matrix, but that's not the biggest problem. The tricky part is the part of the gradient of the cost function that is related to the observation. So I don't know if it's straightforward for you to see that this equation here is the gradient of this equation here, but it, 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 that is just what I have written using the Jacobian of the generalized observation operator um, and just taking the gradient. So basically you have the linear tangent linear model that is needed as well as this uh, transpose, and you also have the observation operator, the simple part of it, uh, the linear part, and its adjoint that are needed. And you want to compute this here. So one way to do it over time is to start from the end and go backward in time. And for that, you need, well, this is what the the transpose of H and M are doing here. And you're basically integrating, integrating the adjoint of your dynamical model. And in this word, the transpose and the adjoint are the same. So with just one background integration of your adjoint model starting from zero, you basically go backward in time over observation slices um, from the last observation that is uh, that has subscript nt, and you apply the adjoint operator of h and m piece by piece using the innovation d, so that with the, with only one backward integration of the adjoint in time, you have an estimation um, of the of this part of the gradient of the part that relates to the observation. So this is really neat because. This is a straightforward estimation of the gradient, but it means that you have to formulate the transpose of H and the transpose, meaning the adjoint, of your model. And it's a tricky part because first I told you that you needed the linear of your model with respect to the control variable, but now you need the adjoint. So if you were to do that with your own hands, I mean coding the adjoint of each uh, Fortran code of your piece of code, you also have to do the adjoint part. So it's a bit of a tedious work, but it, that's the way to do it. And also I mentioned automatic auto differentiation, uh, differentiation softwares. They will also do that for you because once you have the linear code, it's not that hard to have the adjoint code. But this is something you should be aware of. Hiding in the gradient, you do have the adjoint of the observation operator in here. Uh, okay, um, so 
just to give you a, a, a summary of this formulation with the delta x, it's called the incremental 4 var and basically it requires you to live in a world of anomaly. So you compute the cost function at each iteration of the minimization. You have to integrate once the nonlinear model from T0 to Tn in order to express the background trajectory. You compute and store each difference, each difference between the model state and the observation. You accumulate that in the second part of uh, the cost function. Then you have to compute the gradient of the cost function. So for that, you have to integrate the adjoint model in time. Uh, usually, I mean, it's usually it can be a lot more. It's at least four times more, exam more expensive than the direct model. And then you end up, the last value of this back backward in uh, integration is the gradient of the cost function. And then when you have the gradient, it's really easy because any optimi optimization tool will provide you with a new step and uh, then you can loop around your, uh, your minimization. Uh, then again, the tangent linear and the adjoint codes of your model and your observation uh, operator uh, should be uh, made available to you. Uh, if it's not, if you don't want to or you yeah, if you don't want to or you can't uh, compute the tangent linear of your model because your model has a thousand and thousand lines of, of uh, code, of Fortran code. It was coded by your PhD advisor or, or its PhD advisor 20 years ago and nobody wants to manually derivate this piece of code with respect to the control vector that you have decided that you wanted to control or whatever reason, you just don't have the tangent linear of your model and there's no way you're going to do it. Or it, too, it may be too expensive. You, your forward code is already too expensive and there's no way that you can pay the price of a four times more expensive iteration at each iter sub-iteration of your quadratic uh, cost function. So you have to do to live without M transpose, basically. And what you can do is assume that the tangent linear dynamic of the model is a persistent model. So basically, if you were to propagate an anomaly with your, tangent, with your model, it will remain the same. If you add up one degree here, and I integrate my uh, diffusion uh, model in this room, uh, it would mean that my one degree um, correction stays here. It's not diffused, it's not advected, it's, it stays here. So of course, uh, formulated that way, it, it, it seems to be really stupid, but for, for some, over a period of time, over a short period of time, uh, for some physics, it's reasonable to assume that your linear dynamic can be um, simplified to a persistent model. And when you do that, then life become, becomes really easier because in here, M just disappeared. Well, it doesn't disappear, it's just the identity metric, so it's really cool. Usually you don't have problem with that. Uh, we've said it was linear interpolation or something easy. So from your, with your 4 var cost function and assuming that the tangent linear model is a persistence model, then the increment is just not propagated by the tangent linear physics. It's just constant over the assimilation window and delta x here just pops out really easily and it can be applied anywhere over your time window. So all you have to do is compute the trajectory, the background trajectory, compute the innovation di, sorry, it was dj uh, in the previous slide, and then you don't have to multiply by the adjoint of your model. And you they directly have the, the uh, quadratic, uh, sorry, the gradient of the quadratic approximation of your cost function. And it's really, uh, it's really less expensive. Well, of course, you have to figure out if it makes sense or not to assume that the tangent linear model is the identity. And it can be reasonable over a short period of time, but it can be a total nonsense over a longer period of time. And this assumption can really get you into trouble when you think of 
correcting the model parameter. Because when I think of it as I am correcting the initial condition, it could make sense. Uh, I'm adding a correction to the initial condition, and I assume that this, that this anomaly is propagated by the tangent linear model, and it, so it's not really propagated, it just remains the same, okay? My initial condition is not modified. But if I'm correcting some parameters, there's no way I can uh, assume that the tangent linear uh, physics that takes me from the parameter world to the observation world uh, is the identity matrix. I mean, the, 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 the physics that takes me from the coefficient diffusion world to temperature world, it's not the identity. I need to, 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 to propagate some physics. I need to translate this coefficient, this parameter, into something physical. And the, the diffusion model will do that for you. It will use the parameter to provide you with some observed, observ observable uh, variable. But if you just say the tangent linear is the identity, well, your diffusion coefficient will remain a coefficient, uh, diffusion coefficient, and you will never be able to compare it to the observation. So this assumption is a total nonsense when you do model parameter correction. It's, well, no, it doesn't make sense. So when you correct model parameter, you usually really have to write the tangent linear of your physics with respect to the parameter as well as its adjoint. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, just a summary now of the pros and cons of the incremental formulation. So the 4D increment algorithm implies uh, a, first, a, first, a single integration of the nonlinear model to compute the innovation, and then you have to do as many integration of the tangent linear and adjoint as needed for the minimization. So this is expensive, but you have to do it once, and you have to do it. There's no way around. And then this is really the, the cost, uh, the additional cost of the 4D bar. And this can be reduced in a 3D FGAT. So this, this is, sorry, I forgot to give you the name of uh, this algorithm with the 4D bar and the assumption of tangent linear. It's called the 3D FGAT. So you don't need tangent linear and adjoint code. Of course, you have a reduction of the computational cost for the optimization. But you have to decide that it's OK for you to live with the approximation of the linear physics around the, around the background. And um, OK, should I talk about that? Uh, I will move on to, the, um, to section four now and talk a little bit about matrices. Uh, because I uh, kind of told you that you should put something in B and we don't know what to put and I don't want you to leave this room without knowing what actually you are going to put in B. So um, the question is, what do we put in B but also in R? So let's just recall the solution that we've seen a couple of times before. Um, the B matrix is related to the background, and the air matrix is related to the observation. And now we're, trying to, we're going to try to really understand, to really see the, the role of the B matrix for now. So think of it as the increment is the multiplication of the B matrix by alpha. And alpha is this part here. You can also write it as B. Uh, G transposed and beta, and then beta is here. And uh, in this case, um, alpha has the dimension of N, which is the control, and beta has the dimension of P, which is the observation vector. Okay, so just try to keep that in mind for the following slides. You can write the solution explicitly in matrix notation. Delta x is the multiplication of b. The small b's are the columns of the b matrix by the vector alpha. And not, we don't really care about what's in the alpha. But basically, the delta x, the analysis, the correction, is the combination of columns of the b matrix. You can also think of it as delta x being the combination of the matrix B multiplied by G transpose. Why am I kind of keeping those two uh, notation? Is that this, this point of view is kind of, it's, it's used by, in the community, because R, those, those, uh, those vector here, 
These are the columns of the B time G transpose matrix. They are called the representers, and that's something that you may see in the literature. Uh, so at least I wanted to mention this, this, this word. Um, but basically, delta x is the, the combination, the sum of some coefficient, and it has the innovation in it, by the multiplication of the columns of some matrix, either the B matrix or the B times G transpose matrix. Um, so I'll, I'll stick to those two notation. Um, next one. Okay, let's consider that on an example. We are going to solve the three divar equation with a single observation. So the, the innovation vector D is now just a scalar. It's the difference between what the model says and what the observation says at one point in time. Uh, and it's an innovation of a model variable, and it's located at model grid point. So H is really simple. It has zeros everywhere and one at one location. It has zero everywhere. You are not observing your variable on the grid of the model grid, okay? It's full of zero, and it just extracts whatever the model says at the green point where you have uh, set your thermometer. Um, now you live in an easy world. Sorry, you live in an easy world where you have one observation. So R comes down to a scalar, and this is similar assumption to what we did this morning. And um, so you can easily compute G times B times G transpose, um, and it's the scalar variance since you have one element in G. And basically, it's the variance of uh, of uh, the background, the representer is the one, uh, the one column of B that corresponds to the position on your grid, on your model grid the, with the subscript I. And then the increment delta X is just the multiplication of the, the innovation, so the difference in temperature between what the model says and the observation divided by the sum of the variances, so the sum of the uncertainty, and multiply by the B matrix. So basically, um, what you have at one location where you had your thermometer is going to be spread over space by this column of B here. So you kind of... Um, Propagate, but it's not really the, it's not the model, and I should not be using propagate. It's a, it's a spread maybe from the point where you're observing to the other grid point of your model, and this is all because you have specified something in the B matrix in this one column, and we go back to this idea of spatial correlation of the model errors between one error here and one error there. If I'm observing here and I know that the errors in my model are correlated, strongly correlated, then it means that what, am I, what, am I, what I am observing here is going to help me correcting there. And this is all because what's in B. Um, what else can we say with this notation? Um, if, you, if you write it in the observation space, so basically you multiply, you increment by the observation operator, you see that you have this color quantity here in front of the innovation vector. And if you look at it a little bit more closely here, it, it implies that the analysis always lies between the background and the observation. So basically, the, the, the difference, I'm talking in the observation space, between the analysis and the background is smaller than the innovation. So basically smaller than the distance between the background and the observation. So it means that the analysis is somewhere in between. And it's the same for the, for the other part. So you have, with those two uh, inequality, you can really say that the analysis is somewhere between the background and the observation. So we really go back to the, this barycentric uh, ID of the data assimilation that we started with. Um, okay, it, it gets a little bit more complicated when you take into account the, the time in, in, the, in the algorithm, and you see that 
in this matrix here will propagate the, 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 the information on your error. And basically, the model, the tangent linear model and its adjoint are really going to um, move spread the uncertainty from one point to the other. Let me just illustrate that with, uh, with schemes rather than with equation. Um, let's assume you have one observation uh, at one location, and so your observation operator is uh, full of zero and has just one. When you multiply that by m transpose, basically it, it it's forward in time, so you're trying to figure out what type of pattern for your model variable would lead you to the red dot here, the red dot here. So this is M transpose. This is what the B matrix does. So basically, it spreads the information specially. See, you had that. And for instance, try to focus on this circle here. It's like in the B matrix, you have some um, circular correlation of your error in the neighboring in the neighboring of your observation location here. So this is spreading over over space, and then you have the propagation of M. So that would propagate the the, the statistics that you had in B M transpose. And in the end, you end up if you look at the variance, you just have to take one element of this big matrix. So basically, the assumption you make on your error statistics in your model are either going to remain um, station stationary in the 3D var because you have no tangent linear propagation, or they are going to implicitly evolve over time by in the 4D var algorithm because you propagated the background error covariance matrix B uh, by multiplying it by the M transpose that corresponds to the model and also to the to the um, sorry to the model adjoint and to and by the model. So the 4 var really is implicitly you, you're not providing it. It's implicitly um, propagating over time the statistics uh, the error statistics on your background. Okay, now what do we put in, in B that now that we've seen that it's of, um, of great interest? Usually, we don't have information on that. Well, I'm not gonna recall those expressions uh, unless I need to, but I think there's nothing new here. Um, you can do it um, if you have a small system, but you have first to keep in mind that B is a, a symmetric matrix, and the number of independent elements that needs to be specified depends on the size of your control vector. So I'm assuming I have a control vector of size n. If you're correcting the initial condition for ocean, for example, n is equal to 10 to the power of 6. So B has 10 to the power of 12 plus 10 to the power of 6 divided by two elements that you need to specify. So that is a lot. Um, and even if you um, could specify it, even if you could store it, you still have to figure out a way uh, to represent those statistics because you have to, f to, to deal with the fact that you don't know the truth. So one way to do it is to use innovation vector. So basically, you're going to uh, assume that the, the statistics of the difference between the background and the true states are kind of similar to the statistics of the difference between the background and the observation, kind of. So you compute all the innovation, the D, the D vector that you've seen before, so that's the difference between the observation vector and the background vector equivalent uh, in the observation space, and if you do a little bit of math, adding into that equation the, the true state in the control space and in the observation space, you can see that with this innovation vector, you, you have the observation error and the background error kicking in. So if you do some statistics on a whole bunch of innovation vectors, you get some estimation of R and G times B times G transpose. 
So you can get some estimate if you have a whole bunch of discrepancies between model and the observation. Well, the tricky part is, OK, I get an estimation. But I get an estimation of the sum of those two guys. And I really need to specify them separately. Um, so that's something you can do, assuming that you have no correlation uh, in the observation and that all the spatial correlation are in the background. So that's, that's usually what you do it. You just specify the R matrix as a diagonal matrix and that all the spatial term, the spatial correlation terms go in the B matrix. So basically, from this guy here, you get some estimate of the diagonal of R and whatever remains gets included in the B matrix. I'm not going to go into detail, but you have all the details in the, in the kind of old paper, but it's a really good one in, in here. Um, so this is a pure method for estimating covariances, but it really requires a dense observation network because I told you that you need to do some statistical estimates on innovation. And also, it requires to deal with observation with uncorrelated error. That's really too bad because we have a whole bunch of observation, but usually they are remote sensing observation. And they are not uncorrelated. They don't have uncorrelated errors. So this is a serious limitation for this way to estimating B and R. Um, you can also do it some, uh, using some aposteroid diagnostic, and this was explained in detail in a couple of papers by Gérald Desrosiers from Météo France. So it still um, rely on the estimation of statistics of, on the innovation, but now it's the, the innovation is the difference between um, the observation and the background, so it's DB, and the statistics between the observation and the analysis, so it's DA. So you compute a whole bunch of discrepancies between what the model says and the observation before the analysis, that's DB, and you compute a whole bunch of discrepancies between what the model says and the observation, but after the analysis, that's DA. I won't detail all the math, but you can see that if you compute the, the average on those guys and do a little bit of math here, you can estimate either R or G times B transpose, uh, sorry, there's no transpose here, uh, G transpose here. So this is a nice way to do it, but it has, um, the problem is that you're doing the data assimilation and then you're computing some criteria using statistics on the results of data assimilation. So basically, the assumption that you made at the beginning on B and R, you're going to use them to really carry out the analysis, compute the innovation, and then compute the criteria and provide some new estimates. So basically, whatever you're using at the beginning is going to have an impact on the solution that you get in the end. So it's one way to do it, but it's, um, I don't know, there's no perfect answer. Um, uh, maybe I won't go in, into details on that, Vivian, because I'm sure you'll, you'll talk about that this afternoon. But um, I, I mentioned that uh, the data simulation algorithm is sequentially applied over time. And each time you have to provide it over each cycle, you have to provide the B matrix and the R matrix. Well, you'll see that the Kalman filter explicitly propagate those matrices. So basically, for each cycle, starting from the first cycle where you actually put something in, the Kalman filter equation will enable you to provide a time-evolving description of the B matrix. OK, well, but for this afternoon, the B matrix will be the P matrix. But never mind, you'll be fine. <laughs> Um, I won't go into details, but uh, just looking at this equation, so this is the B matrix, right? Um, you, you see that you have to multiply it by M, the tangent linear for your model, and it's adjoint. So you kind of send, you kind of feel already that you st you're still in trouble. I mean, there's just no magic algorithm. 
the, the difficulties we have with the variational algorithm, we'll just run into this same difficulties this afternoon with filtering algorithm. Okay. Um, you can also do some uh, estimation of the background error statistics using some model generator. So basically, you're going to define a model proxy for background error. You, you have two ways to do that. It, one of them is called the NMC method. It, is quite, um, it has been really used intensively in meteorology. You assume that the difference between the background and the true states uh, statistics are somehow similar to some anomaly. And this anomaly can be a pair of model forecasts that are valid at the same time. So basically, it's like you have an ensemble of model forecasts and you compute differences between them and you, and you say, okay, the statistics that I have on this anomaly are similar to the statistic that I should be describing for the, the difference between background and, and truth. Um, not really saying that it's fair, um, just saying that it's used and it's hard to know what the dynamic of an error to the true state really is. But if you assume that you have a model one and a model two, you can say that model one is a true description of the system for, model, for the other model. So that's a way to see it, it's kind of cheating. Uh, saying that the true is described by model one and then you compute the statistics for model two. Um, it, basically, you have to find a way to go around the fact that you don't know the truth. So th this, is, this is intensively used. Um, again, you need a whole bunch of, uh, of forecasts. You need to do some stochastic uh, um, estimation on, um, on a large number of, uh, of model estimation, either in time or for an ensemble of uh, model forecast. If you have expensive model, it could be, it could be tricky then. Um, it kind of follows the same ID, but basically, um, you will see that in the ensemble Kalman filter this afternoon, you can stochastically estimate the background error covariance matrix from a sample of perturbed background states. Basically, you start from, let's say, one initial condition, and you integrate the model forward in time with different uh, boundary condition, with perturbed boundary condition. And you, so you end up with a whole bunch of outputs. You, um, you end up with a sample of outputs. And you can compute some statistics on those different uh, background states. And now you're assuming that the, the, statistics of, the statistics of this sample are similar to the statistics of the different to the true states. So it's like you're assuming the true state is the mean of your ensemble. And it's kind of okay to assume that if your ensemble is properly described. But then I know you will talk about that, Vivian. <laughs> okay. Um, you may run into, you may have troubles when you do that if you have a sample that is not large enough. And usually you don't have a sample that is large enough because your model is expensive and you don't want to use a Monte Carlo approach to run uh, southern and southern of foreign model integration. So you have a whole bunch of XB and you have converged statistics on the, on the background model error uh, matrix. So you have ways to go around that, and that's the uh, localization um, method. Basically, you have a small sample, let's say 50 integration of your mo forward model um, integration. If you compute the covariance within this, within this ensemble, and you look at the co spatial correlation uh, function, so that's basically, look at it at, as space, and we're trying to, to plot the correlation function for, between the error at point zero and the errors somewhere else. And somewhere else goes from minus 10 to plus 10. So at point zero, my error is really correlated with my error. Okay, makes sense. Okay, well, that's something you have to check. 
and <laughs> the further I'm going, and the smaller my correlation is, okay? And you see that you have some wiggles here, and it's not really physical. You probably have all those wiggles because you have computed the estimation of your correlation uh, uh, values on, a, on an ensemble that, that is too small. So basically, if you cannot pay more than 50 integration of your model, you're going to have those wiggle. I'm saying 50, but it could be anything. I mean, don't take it for granted. Um, you basically have to filter out those wiggles. And this is something you do with the loca localization uh, techniques. So basically, you, you, you compute your statistics within your ensemble, and you multiply this guy by a localization matrix. It has like a, a cutoff uh, correlation length scale that would get, enable you to get rid of those wiggles here. Well, the key question is how do you specify those uh, localization distance? And is it really noise that you see here? Or is it physical? I mean, you don't really know. You know you're going to filter out everything that is beyond whatever you decide. Uh, whether you should be doing it or not, you really have to, to pay attention to what you're doing that here. And um, I'll just take a couple uh, more minutes to, to, to say that before going to the references. Um, modeling B, actually, is, is tricky because it's big. So there's a whole bunch of uh, advanced, metal, advanced algorithm that instead of really trying to figure out B in, in its entire space, uh, we'll try to reduce the, the control vector space to the most important mode. And here you can go with SVD, you can go with uh, whatever you can think of. But basically, you can, you're going to reduce the rank of your B matrix and then just work with a smaller B matrix. And then it's easier to do the math. It's easier to minimize the cost function. But the big question is, how do I define my reduced space? OK, I don't know. Um, I'll just probably stop here and leave you with some references on variational data assimilation. And this is clearly not exhaustive, and I'm sure Vivian will have some additional stuff. Uh, you, you have some like referen reference book, like the Daily Book. The Tarantola book is really, really good. Those papers that I've uh, cited before, um, then you have a whole bunch of technical reports from ECMWF, which is the Operational Weather Center in, a, um, in Reading. And they have a really nice uh, explanation on data assimilation. You also have a whole bunch of data assimilation training courses in France, but also uh, beyond France. I'm, I have just cited uh, the, the ones that I know the, the best. Well, we have a data assimilation training course at Surfax. It's organized once a year. Um, you will find everything you need on that on the Surfax web page on the train, under the training um, uh, subcategory. You really have also a nice training course that is given by our uh, colleagues at Grenoble. Eric Blayot and Emmanuel Coma are deeply involved in that. It's usually in December or January, I can't really remember. And you will really have a nice description of all the math you need for the algorithm we, we, we've seen. And I think it's a one week training, so you'll get all the details that I've left the part uh, uh, aside today. Um, you should really go to ECMWF to attend the data assimilation training course, especially if you're going to work in atmospheric sciences, air, chem air, air quality, or big system. It's really what they do. So you, you can check that out. And I have no idea whether the data assimilation session at uh, Leouche will occur again in, next year but they had some really nice um, summer school, even though it was in spring or winter, never mind. Uh, but it was really nice. If you guys want to know more about data assimilation, you should check the Leouche site web. Um, well, and that's it for now. If, if, for me, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much.